Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome. I'm Chava Tiroz Samuelson. I'm the director of Jewish studies at TSU. I'm also Regents Professor of History and Irving and Miriam Law Professor of Modern Judaism. As you know, uh, tonight is the second lecture in our lecture series on Jewish literature beyond the Cold War, Legacies and Futures. Last week, Professor Brian Goodman whom you can see on the screen as well, uh, introduce us to very interesting but little known figures and texts from Czechoslovakia that explored fascinating connections between Jewish authors in the United States, especially Philip Roth, and dissident authors and translators in Czechoslovakia, such as Rita Klimova and Jerzy Vai. Tonight, Professor Joe Lockhart will focus on a novel of the famous Israeli author David Grossman. If I'm not mistaken, he is also a winner of the Booker Prize, right, uh, Joe? Um, so his novel uh, connects seemingly very different experiences of incarceration, dislocation, suffering, and we're going to hear uh, events that take place in Europe, uh, especially in Croatia or of the Croatian uh, shore and in Israel. So this novel is based on a real life story of a Yugoslavian, Yugoslavian partisan fighter. I uh, believe her name is uh, a real person. Eva Panic, I believe is her name. And uh, David Grossman himself was familiar with her. And actually they developed a, a, a deep friendship as far as I understand it for over 20 years. Now in the story we are going on, in the novel, we are going to hear uh, oh, about three women. It's kind of uh, quite quite complicated. The grandmother is Vera, and she was incarcerated in Goli Otok, which you can see behind uh, Joe Lockhart in the, you know, that he's going to tell us more about it. This happens in the 50s. Her daughter, Nina, which is, she's her daughter from Vera's first marriage, and the granddaughter, Gilly, who was born to Nina, when Nina had sex with her own stepbrother. If I understand from what I read, that's a very complicated situation. And both Nina and Vera abandoned their own daughters at a very young age. So the novel explores themes of incarceration, abandonment, loss, love, reunion, and so forth. And I can't hear... Can't wait to hear Professor Lockhart really explain to us this very complex story. So let me introduce Professor Lockhart. He uh, received his PhD in UC Berkeley in 2000. He joined the ASU English Department in 2002. And since then, he has taught in nine colleges, among them nine colleges and universities in four different countries. So in the United States, he taught at UC Santa Cruz, UC Berkeley, uh, UC Davis and Mills College. In Israel, he taught in Kibbutzim College of Education, that's Seminar Kibbutzim in Tel Aviv, and then uh, Bet Golden Teachers College in Haifa. In the Czech Republic, he taught at Palatki University in Olomouc. I hope I pronounced it close enough. And in China, he taught in Sichuan University in Chengdu, China. So his specialization is anti-slavery literature and human rights philosophy in relation to 19th century American literature. In 2003, he established uh, the Anti-Slavery Literature Project, which digitized and made accessible a very large body of anti-slavery literature in a format that is accessible to scholars as well as to the general public. Um, the website had over a million visits or hits. Finally, it went offline in 2018, but he continues uh, to research uh, related topics uh, in a project called the Slave Narrative Initiative, which he conducted uh, with, in collaboration with faculty member of Xi'an Jiantong University in China. Uh, and out of that collaboration came three volumes, co-edited volumes of American uh, slave narratives that was published that were published in Shanghai Jiangtong. I hope I said correctly. University Press. Uh, most relevant to our discussion is the fact this discussion tonight is the fact that Professor Lockhart founded the Pri the Prison English Project, which is now called the Prison Education Program. 
in Florence State Prison here in Arizona, in Florence, Arizona. And uh, in that uh, setting, he helped create the Florence Poetry Collective on the Death Row Unit, no less. At ASU, he teaches undergraduate and graduate courses on prison literature. And he has published an uh, edited volume under the title of Prison Pedagogies, um, Learning and Teaching with Prisoners that came out at uh, Syracuse University Press. He has another uh, volume that he's working on now on STEM education and U.S. prisons that will come out in Brill. He has several other uh, volumes uh, co-authored on various interesting topics uh, that are somewhat connected, but also quite separate. So there's a volume on Iraq war culture. There's a volume on watching slavery, witness texts and travel reports. Another volume on brave new classrooms, democratic education and the internet. So you see how broad are his uh, cult kind of cultural and literary interests. And tonight he's going to focus on David Grossman more than I love my life and explain how that novel relates to carceral legacies. So, uh, Joe, the screen is yours. We are all waiting to hear about this very interesting novel. Thank you very much, Hava. And uh, I'm pleased to be here and talk. Um, you'll see the screen behind me. That's a picture of uh, Goli Otak Island, where I will be, where we'll be discussing. Uh, first, I'd like to uh, show people uh, just a few slides so that we have some reference as to people and place. Uh, David Grossman, who should be well known uh, as uh, one of Israel's leading writers. Uh, this is the real life subject, uh, Eva Panich Nahir. Uh, who was a, as Hava mentioned, a close friend of uh, Grossman. Um, let's see. And there's the uh, U.S. Uh, edition of the novel. This is Goli Otak, which, as you see, is just off the Croatian coast. Uh, and it is basically bare rock. Uh, the um, uh, there are remnant buildings on it from the prison. It's think of it as like sort of the Alcatraz of the Croatian coast. And a few pictures of the um, remaining ruins, dormitories, and so forth. And more illustrations. You can take a boat out from the uh, nearby port and uh, visit. That's part of the novel. Um, some uh, prisoners on Goli Otak. Uh, these would be Stalinists opposed to the split with the Soviet Union. This is 1951. And as you also see there, I love the, how they sort of ring the red star there uh, for the photograph. And finally, another view of the island. Okay, what I'm gonna do for the next uh, 40 minutes is I will read. Uh, this is a draft paper, um, unpublished, and um, I'll be interested in your opinions and comments. In 1956, the Stalinist writer Venko Markovsky um, published a pseudonymous Bulgarian language poem titled Suvremeni Paradoxi. Contemporary Paradoxes. The poem denounced Titoism as a revisionist ideology that collaborated with Western powers and betrayed communist ideals. When his identity was betrayed, a court in Skopje uh, sentenced Markovsky to five years imprisonment at the prison island of Goli Otak, where he joined thousands of uh, so-called common formists 
who sympathized with the Soviet Union rather than Tito's government in Yugoslavia. Many other island prisoners simply were caught up in the widespread purges and mass arrests that began in June 1948 with Tito's split from Stalin. By the time Markovsky arrived, Goliotok was no longer quite the brutal scene of mass murder it had been following the 1949 establishment of the prison, although he witnessed cruel treatment, tortures, and murder. The main prison accommodated about 3,500 to 4,000 at a time, often prisoners serving repeat sentences over questions of loyalty to Tito. A separate smaller women's prisoner held about 700 prisoners. From 1948 to 1956, 15,757 people were incarcerated there. About 400 died or were murdered and never left the island. Goliotok differed from other prisons where authorities interrogated prisoners. The innovation here was that prisoners terrorized each other through an internal authority structure that relied on informers and collaboration with authorities to gain promotion to warder status and eventual release. Today, the island is a tourist site, including one as yet unrealized proposal by a local tourism association to promote imprisonment and torture to attract extreme tourism. All right. Um, Western governments overlooked Goliotok so long as Tito's security forces were jailing Stalinists and alleged Stalinists without trial. As Claudio Magris uh, characterized the prevailing silence from idealists within the Tito-West branch of communism, along with Western observers, quote, it's not surprising that it is kept silent for so long about Goli Otak as well, about that dishonor that rained down on everything and everyone on the party, the anti-party, and those who kept their mouths shut on the other side and were overjoyed to see how the communists ended up. End quote. Closer examination would have contradicted Tito's reputed tolerance for dissent, visible in his restrained treatment of a few former comrades turned critics, such as Milovan Gilas. Within Yugoslavia, Goliotok was unmentionable in public discussion. Even government documents did not mention it by name, instead referring to the prison site as murmur. Marble, and former prisoners as Mermerasi, reference being to marble qual uh, quarries on the island. Secret police documents referred to the prison island as Radiliste, the work site. Goliotok emerged from historical shadows in the early 1980s following the 1980 death of Tito and the unraveling of Yugoslavia into separate republics. Former prisoners published in several languages what became known as Goli Otak literature, the regional variant on Gulag literature. Markovsky's account, published in English as Goli Otak, the Island of Death in 1984, was among the earliest and best known of these narratives. Markovsky, who did not appreciate the irony of a devoted Stalinist complaining about prisons, found himself in another world when he arrived on the island. He wrote, quote, shadows, not real human beings dwell on Goli Otak, shadows of our former freedom fighters. On Goli Otak, human beings are reduced to things, to numbers. They're treated as mere quantities. They live in rags and tatters. From dawn to dusk, a sorrowful train of people moves back and forth across the desert that is Goli Otak. Their eyes are sunken, their hands have been broken in inhuman toiling, their legs drag as if bound by heavy chains. Where Malkovsky remained haunted by Goli Otak as a place of inhumane violation, torture, and death, those prison memories served as a political indictment against Tito and what he re uh, represented for splitting from the Soviet bloc to establish independence. He viewed the whole of his five-year incarceration through a resolutely Stalinist lens, as a minuscule part of a vast pattern of betrayal that led to Khrushchev's reformism 
and uh, Nagy's revolt against Soviet domination over Hungary. The living ghosts that Markovsky encountered were the ghosts of a patriotic communism he believed was being extinguished by anti-Stalinist forces. Poliotok was a murderous penal instrument of an authoritarian government. In David Grossman's novel, More Than I Love My Life, we encounter a different ghost from Goliotak, far less political, and now the subjects of psychological excavation. The socialist ethos of the kibbutz, part of the background in early passages of the novel, has nearly faded from view, and the prison's history as a field of contest between two opposed communist camps is here <laughs> um, an obscure political feature. Goliotok becomes a symbol of past traumas to be confronted and part of a difficult intertwined uh, love stories to be uh, unfolded. <clears throat> While the prison cannot be depoliticized, the novel de-emphasizes this political history in order to portray deeply conflicted family personalities that have been shaped directly and indirectly by carceral experience. The prison exemplifies a generational engagement with the knowledge, both open and hidden, of incarceration. Grossman based the story loosely on the life of his longtime friend, Eva Panich Nakir, a member of Kibbutz Shara and Mekim. Part of the reader's work lies in estimating where the skeletal real story ends and Grossman's imaginative layers of muscle and flesh must begin. As author, Grossman occupies a delicate interpretive and ethical role, one where with the knowledge, consent, and encouragement of his subjects, a former prisoner and her adult daughter, he converts their stories into a very different narrative. In the acknowledgments, Grossman thanks Panish Nahir and her daughter, Tiana Vajas, for granting him, quote, the freedom to tell the story but also to imagine and invent it in ways it never existed." End quote. This reimagining into a mixture of facts and fiction or faction involves shifts that create an unusual formation in prison-themed literature. More commonly, the project of many prison narratives lies in providing a realistic encounter with formative experiences prior to incarceration, followed by the daily vicissitudes of prison or post-prison life. Grossman takes a different route, one that spends most of the novel describing the troubled histories and interactions of four major persona from the family, their trip to the prison island off the Croatian coast, and then a culminating overnight on the island and family reconciliation. This is an uncommon plot structure in prison writing one that risks romanticizing horrific real life experience. Social literalists, uh, literalists might object to the avoidance of detail in relation to prison as community, such as one encounters in a Russian tradition of prison writing that encompasses both uh, Dostoevsky's House of the Dead and Solzhenitsyn's One Day in the Life of Ivan Denisovich. Community here resides within a fractured family struggling to regain its integrity by expressing their love for one another, not within the anti-community of strife-ridden prison life on Goli Otak. Prison is the antithesis of community in this novel, unlike in John Updike's Falconer, fiction written in the shadow of the 1971 Attica uprising and where prisoners form a resistant community. The prison of Grossman's novel only destroys families and does not permit cohesion among prisoners. Grossman's ethical engagement lies not in the granular rendition of prison detail, but rather in the psychological domain, specifically the interpersonal consequences of um, an excruciating choice that leads to incarceration. Post-carceral -car characterization and the vital force of a singular protagonist, Vera, provide the narrative drive. She is a woman who not only survived nearly three years in a deadly political prison, but in whom survival created an indomitable character. 
the ethical focus centered uh, centers, as the English language title suggests, and that's another point to be raised, on both the power of love to overcome extreme duress and the limits that love encounters. Critical discussion of more than I love my life uh, has not delved deeply into the carceral aspects of the novel, taking this more as a historical plot element rather than as providing a narrative foundation. Strangely, none of the discussion has identified prison islands as a classic romantic locus, a point that becomes clear late in the story. The Croatian prison materializes only towards the end of the novel as a foreign scene. Most of the narrative describes the histories of the protagonists and their fateful decision to travel together to make a documentary film about a journey from Israel to revisit the prison. The mother, Vera, as a precarceral subject, informs an incarcerated subject, who in turn becomes a postcarceral narrator. Her daughter, Vera, and stepson, Raphael, become subjects whose lives have been informed and deformed by Vera's incarceration and the loss of her first husband to prison torture. Vera's granddaughter, Gili, is a documentary filmmaker attempting to understand and capture these generational sequelae of Vera's imprisonment and the forced choice she made between loyalty to a beloved husband's memory and the care needs of her young daughter. Vera chose her murdered husband and imprisonment after refusing to denounce him as a Stalinist traitor. In making that choice, Vera dramatically reshaped the lives of her child and those who later entered her life after release from prison. Prison and imprisonment are both metaphor and reality intermingled within the novel. For her part, Vera treats prison as a past reality that she has left behind. She says, quote, there was simply a dictatorship. And just like a hundred other dictatorships through history, they throw a woman named Vera Novak into the gulag for three years. And on the way, they also screwed up her daughter's life. Big deal. What's the story? What's the fuss? It happened. It's over. On we go. Chin up. End quote. Grossman treats Vera as mostly admirable character, presumably due to her his friendship with her model, Ava Panachinahir. She's a survivor who looks past her wounds, one whose harsh treatment in life has toughened her emotional surface. Like Panachinahir, Vera is born into a well-off, cultured Jewish commercial family against whose norms she rebels. She comes to identify with the resilience of Croatia's rural mountain peasantry, among whom she spends much of the war period. Vera speaks from this proletarian identity that she has learned and adopted. Her story is only one of millions of people in Eastern Europe who have been incarcerated, whose lives have been abused by dictatorial regimes. The status of former prisoners and identity shared uh, by so many as to be a commonplace unworthy of privilege. There is heavily representative of an older generation accustomed to a social reality of Nazi and Stalinist jails and murderous prison camps. Grossman captures a Serbo-Croatian accent and speech habits in Vera's Hebrew, neatly rendered in Jessica Cohen's English translation. In so doing, in doing so with a, such a strong character, Grossman punctures prevalent stereotypes in Israel of accented or limited Hebrew speakers as less intelligent, ill-informed, or of slight civic standing. Born in Europe and brought to Israel as a child, Vera's daughter Nina is a member of a uh, transitional generation between Eastern Europe and Israel. Her fictional characterization differs heavily from the real-life Tiana Vajas. The trauma for a six-and-a-half-year-old child of losing first her father, a purged army officer mur murdered in a Titoist jail cell, and then days later her mother imprisoned for refusing to denounce her dead husband, was immense. Nina, who lived with an, her abusive aunt when her mother was arrested and disappeared from her life, is haunted by the specter of parental incarceration and loss. Speaking to Raphael, her lifelong and constantly disappointed lover, Nina tells him, quote, 
Maybe you'll decide I need to be exiled, sent away for re-education, maybe to a prison on an island. Islands seem to work out well for my family, especially a naked island like Goli. But remember, Rafi, remember that you can't scare me with that because I've been on that island for ages. I've been there since I was six and a half and I'm alone there. I was put on the island without sentencing, just like that. End quote. Nina has inherited her mother's decisive and magnetic personality, but remains unable to convert it to positive ends. Instead, she indulges in self-abusive sexuality in her kibbutz home, in her home kibbutz, uh, Jerusalem, New York, and further afield. She abandons her daughter Gili at age three and a half, leaving her to be raised by her child's father, Raphael, Nina's sometime lover and stepbrother from the kibbutz. It is a voluntary abandonment that echoes Vera's coerced abandonment of Nina. She cannot find a home, quote, I'm a person who moves, end quote, Nina tells her daughter, and quote, I'm a leaf in the wind, end quote. Currently living on a winter-bound, isolated island in Norway's Arctic region, one where polar bears roam the village streets, Nina repeats her mother's prison island experience through a form of voluntary self-incarceration. She has returned to Israel in this novel for a family celebration of Vera's 90th birthday on the kibbutz, a celebration during which she finds herself unable to speak in public about her mother. Nina views herself as still incarcerated in spirit on Goli Otak, although she has never seen or been on the island. She has become her mother's generational doppelganger, someone attempting to escape a so far inescapable past. The trajectory of the novel is towards Nina ga gaining emancipation from the island's hold on her life, towards overcoming incarceration's power, and towards a gen uh, genuine reunification with her mother. Boliota constitutes state power that has done her childhood grievous harm. Only late in the novel does Nina discover the secret that her mother had a choice to remain with her, but was unwilling to pay the price of denouncing her late husband Milosh as demanded by authorities. Vera slash Eva chose between two loves and she chose a dead man over a living child. Prison and the sacrifice of her child, even under credible threat, that her daughter would be pushed into street prosecutions and prostitution was a price Vera was willing to pay. Prison becomes both reality and metaphor for complete destruction. Raphael, formerly a film director and now a social worker with gangs in Lud, Israel's third world, is in the third circle of those damaged by an unseen faraway prison angry at what she viewed as betrayal of her murdered father Milos, Nina seduced Rafi at age 12 as revenge for her mother taking a new partner, fellow kibbutznik Tuvia. Rafi tolerated Nina's prostitution while living together in Jerusalem, and for years he has had an irrevocable attachment to her, even after she abandons him and their young daughter Gili. Nina abuses the blameless Raphael in apparent retaliation for the abuse she felt upon having her father and mother disappear into prisons. It is Gili, granddaughter and primary narrator throughout much of the novel, who witnesses and assists the decades delayed post-carceral reconstruction of her family. She too remains in Goliotok's grip, quote, that is the island where significant parts of my childhood and youth took place even though I never spent a minute on it, end quote. Can she liberate herself from the destructive power of that prison island becomes a central question for the novel. It's a question that finds positive answer at the novel's conclusion, where Gilly tells readers that she decided in favor of new family and has a five-and-a-half-year-old daughter named after her mother. Throughout the text, the family forms, reforms, reforms again, and continues to re-enunciate itself beyond the novel's closure. The argument of the final lines and a young child holds that it is not simply Vera's personal strength that vanquishes prison's lingering specter, 
but her family's collective endurance despite stresses, failures, distances, or individual collapses. No simple metaphor, Goliotok represents an emblematic physical presence to be overcome in order to relieve the past and create a viable future. A journey to the prison provides a vehicle for this ameliorative process. Along the way, they visit uh, Vera's childhood memories, her family home, a favorite cafe in her hometown of Kachavec. They encounter local people who range from genuinely kind and deeply regretful at the fate of their former Jewish neighbors, people caught up in recitations of the new Balkan Wars, and one neo-fascist who spits repeatedly in the direction of Jewish visitors. The family quartet becomes embroiled in their own memories, emotions, and secrets. Nina reveals an illness that within several years will wipe clean her memory, so the documentary film they are making is to become the substitute for lost memories. Narrative techniques shift as the family approaches the island. Giri has reached her limits as a documentarist narrator. Third-person sub-narratives are the only sections uh, sections where Grossman steps in as an omniscient narrator. In the first, Vera recounts a formative experience as a Goliotta prisoner. An inmate warden and guard, guard leader blindfolded out of prison and up a mountain. The blindfold being unnecessary since Vera had gone blind temporarily from lack of vitamin A. At the plateau top, Vera believes they intend to topple her over a precipice to her death or shoot her. Instead, she receives a command to stand unmoving in an unmoving posture beneath a hot sun throughout the day. Several times, guards come to feed her, provide a toilet break, and rearrange her stance in a circle she does not yet understand. In the second passage, after weeks of daily being led blindfolded to stand on the mountaintop and driven nearly mad, Vera discovers that she is being employed as a human uh, sunshade for a transplanted small sapling. As she stands hallucinating about the husband, child, and family life together that she has lost, Vera reaches an apotheosis in which the sapling becomes her child. Quote, I'm here, don't worry, I'm protecting you, end quote. She tells the plant. Vera is now again a mother, defying a brutal son in order to shelter life. Quote, the three of them seem to have attained a peculiar equilibrium. There is the sun, there is a plant, and there is Vera, who feels like one of the astral bodies, end quote. Vera has become a small but monumental figure, standing with arms uplifted on a mountain, visible to the prison camp down below. At this point, readers meet the risks of romanticism. Vera becomes near superhuman, a mother separated from a child, but finding new motherhood, a blind woman who sees, a prisoner who liberates herself but remains a prisoner, a human who absorbs blinding sunlight into her eyes and, quote, gives the sun a little bow, a victor's bow, end quote. Grossman elevates Vera beyond the realm of realism into an exalted, magnificent, and mythical domain. He provides a servant of dramatic in, in, in imagery at this peak point, literally and figuratively. But there are ethical considerations in over-romanticization. Humans do not have unlimited ability to absorb and transcend suffering, nor does immeasurable Jobian suffering ennoble. This scene joins the carceral romanticism Byron's tortured soul in the the, the poem of Prisoner of Chillon, uh, where, quote, it was at length the same to me, fettered or fetterless to be, I learned to love despair, end quote. In imagery that embraces suffering, Grossman converts Vera slash Eva Panetta here into a momentary demigoddess, a monumental Promethean figure, one that ironically, if unconsciously, mimics Soviet socialist realism. 
she can convert suffering into empowerment sufficient to oppose nature, the sun itself. The romanticism of carceral life as enabling such heroic transcendence creates a hierarchy of prison suffering, a separation between divine and mundane. The politics of this hierarchy privilege individual fortitude and ability to withstand suffering rather than engagement with the reality that prisons function through collective pain, misery, and disempowerment. The summative image of this scene stands with individualism rather than the collective, an inherent contradiction to Vera Eva's life as a member of the collective. Vera's mothering of the sapling comes to an end in the third passage of omniscient narration, featuring a mountaintop interview between her and commandant, Commandant Maria, a prisoner who was the commanding officer of the camp. Vera's sight has returned after about two months, and now she sees the subject of her guard duty. Although Vera begs with tears for the plant, an echo of how she once begged for her daughter Nina, the commandant forces her to uproot it. Vera's maternal desires suffer defeat once again. As the commandant throws the plant over the cliff, Vera's motherhood dies again symbolically, and she expects to be thrown over too. Vera does not die, and soon after gets released from the camp, but with a belief that, quote, something in her had been murdered on that island, end quote. The novel's denouement reprises these mountaintop scenes, now with all four protagonists watching the sunrise as they finish their overnight stay on the island. Nina has reconciled with her mother, her daughter, and her long-suffering lover, and they with her. As close comes to the story, Nina dramatically changes the closure by throwing the camera off the same cliff next to where her blind mother had stood for so long in the sun. The camera shatters, the documentary film will never be, they too are blinded, and the family must rely on their own memories and words rather than images. Gilly rushes to her mother at the edge of the cliff. Quote, I reached her at the same moment my father did, and together we pulled her back into us, end quote. The successor generations to Goli Otak have recuperated from their legacy pains, have restored emotional unity between themselves. Grossman's closure underlines family as possessing a restorative power, one that provides peace, if not entire healing of historical wounds. Standing at, standing at and beyond the edge and margins of this novel are state actors and petty authority figures who create suffering. They are the small devils, such as Commandant Maria, fashioning the violence of Yugoslav jails and the Goliotak prison camp. Markovsky condemns the Goliotak administration vehemently, writing, quote, that Quote, mean killers and fiendish villains concealed themselves behind the smiles of the authorities. Every word they utter is a lie. Even though they look at you in the eye while talking to you, you should never trust them. Um, <clears throat> they always lie. Lies keep them at their posts, end quote. These actors appear in the narrative only to cause damage but represent a constant uh, presence, as much a narrative force as the novel's familial band of protagonists. Officials, guards, and hidden executioners are crucial figures, even though they have few speaking roles. Darren Byler, in discussing Uyghur prison camps, asks us to consider, quote, how humans still have the capacity to refuse to denarrativize their existence opening up space for thinking with and acting against incomprehensible violence, end quote. The violence that Vera slash Eva experienced and that precipitated the linked series of stories that followed had real life origins within a prison that demanded obedience and denunciation as prisoner self-management, a malignant mutation of the Yugoslav idea of worker self-management. Based on informers and provocateurs, it punished dissent or non-compliance with imprisonment, uh, degradation, injuries, and death. State-compliant actors within and outside the narrative framework make possible the violence and injuries that Vera slash Eva suffered, 
and that were passed on to children and grandchildren as carceral legacies. More than I love my life functions within an expansive memory of memory, expansive memory culture that these social in injuries created among the tens of millions of victims of authoritarianism in Europe and elsewhere, and among descendants who remember what was done to their parents and how their own lives changed in consequence. The literature of this post-carceral memory culture continues to emerge from persistent and new authoritarian formations. The Uyghur memoirist Gulbahar Aitiwachi, uh, sitting in a plane cabin and bound for Paris after three years in a Chinese re-education re camp, remembers leaving her sister an ill mother. Quote, I'd left a piece of myself in their arms, end quote. Freed after pressure from the French government, Etiwachi uh, echoes Markovsky's ghost people on Goli Otak when she recalls, quote, part of my soul too was wandering the frigid halls of Baijiantan, waiting in the courtroom where the policeman who judged me was no doubt passing judgment on other innocent people. Nothing would ever be the same again. The madness sweeping our planet had forever torn me from the peaceful life I'd once lived. My family wouldn't recognize me because I wasn't the same person anymore. Those unspeakable things, prisoners made to be hollowed out shells of themselves, police galvanized by propaganda, all those people reduced to less than human beings by the brutal shock of repression, how could I ever forget them? End quote. The question that Hitiwaji asks, quote, how could I ever forget them? A question with which she closes her memoir provides a launch point for a memory culture that emphasizes the need for democracy and tolerance for individual ideological difference. This is a culture that transforms indignant innocence into political motivation and post-carceral literature into a weapon in behalf of those who remain incarcerated. Hetuaji's uh, memoir of Bai Jian Tan and Grossman's part fiction, part memoir of Gori Otak bridge their genre differences on this point, an insistence that harms be remembered in order to be ended and not repeated. Both operate within a too vast and continually expanding literature of witness against carceral state violence. The question arises of whether Grossman's novel is facing only one family's European past, or also a collective Israeli and Palestinian present and future. Why a fiction of a distant Croatian prison when there are prisons just a few kilometers away in Israel? Why the politics of Yugoslav splitism rather than Israeli-Palestinian splitism? Given a common estimate that some 40% of Palestinian adult men have been incarcerated for shorter or longer duration during Israel's occupation of the Palestinian territories since 1967, might this novel be read as indirect discourse on how carceral legacies have and will shape Palestinian family traumas, social narratives, and public memory culture. References to Arabs and Arab-Jewish conflict are fleeting in the novel. Uh, in nearly the only mentions, Khaled, a Bedouin friend, brings Vera sacks of lavender, and she fruitlessly bemoans the occupation while speaking to her dead second husband alongside his kibbutz grave. Vera participates in women in black demonstrations opposing the occupation. She remembers a younger self declaring, quote, where do I have a homeland? Where there is proletariat, that is where my homeland in, is. I am an internationalist, end quote. Once a prisoner herself, Vera protests now against the oppression and effective military dictatorship over an entire people, her neighbors, the Palestinian proletariat. Vera speaks for an old order, pre-World War II, internationalist left consciousness that lingers on heavily aged and barely alive in the contemporary right-wing nationalist version of Israel. Present uses of incarceration in Israel and Palestine 
provide an inevitable backdrop to a story set on another Mediterranean shore. Grossman leaves this interpretive point to readers, given that it would distract from the story at hand. Instead, Grossman scatters small hints through the texts, signposts for a more local reading that transposes the Yugoslav internal security forces onto the Shin Beit, or the sham suicide of her jailed husband Milos onto healthy young Palestinian men who mysteriously hang themselves or die of heart attacks after brief periods of custody. It remains telling that none of the available Hebrew language reviews and criticism mentions the potential parallels to be found in Israel's prolonged abuse of Palestinians in a range of carceral in institutions, environments, and indeed entire territories. Prisons can form an internal exile within one's own country, whether in Goli Otok off the Croatian coast or Ketziok prison in the Negev desert. Blindness to a obvious reading signals supremacist reading habits. More Than I Love My Life demonstrates the flexibility, adaptability, and sustained power of the prison novel form. Grossman starts out to borrow a set of biographical facts in order to write a fiction about a family, yet it is the prison that permeates and diffuses itself throughout the novel. Prison provides explanations, motivations, tensions, and in the end, establishes itself as the novel's twin center, together with its senior protagonist, a former prisoner. There is narrative dance between historical exposition and present revelation, a dance that circles towards and then round a carceral presence that cannot be denied. Where the prison does not appear, it nonetheless exercises an energizing undercurrent throughout the novel. What this de text demonstrates well is that we do not have to be speaking about a visible prison to understand the presence of an invisible prison, one that continues to exert control over lives remote in place and time. A prison may be both pervasive and decisive for narrative action, even where it has been left behind decades ago and remains far over the geographic horizon. It remains or metastasizes into a psychological infestation. The family's therapeutic return to the source of its generational deformation evidences the control that incarceration of one family member may exercise over an entire family. It is an uncontroverted truism sustained by a massive body of sociological research literature that the effects of incarceration are multi-general. The children and grandchildren of incarcerated people experience the familial, psychological, social, and economic impacts of carceral experience and its traumas. Prison inhabits a home and family life long after a formerly imprisoned parent returns to whatever remains of home. Prisons are a family affair. The experience of carceral legacy is so common that we should question whether to call it a deformation. This is a normative experience whose effects multiply with new generations in their tens and then hundreds of millions of descendants. Incarceration constitutes experience that links Jewish descendants of World War II camp survivors with the carceral legacies of Japanese American families under internment, with earlier African Americans who suffered the neo enslavement of convict labor abuse, or more recently, the massive numbers of young African American men for whom incarceration has become an unremarkable rite of passage, and with Mexican Americans who have endured causeless arrests by racist police, followed by incarceration for having the wrong color. Recognition of the commonalities created by material and psychological carceral legacies, by the knowledge of lost freedom and abuse of a prior generation, provides a basis for comparative discussion of Jewish and global narratives and fictions of incarceration. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. This was fascinating. Let's begin with questions. 
uh, from uh, Brian Goodman and then Natalie Lozinskiewicz, and then maybe I'll add one more question and we'll go to the audience. Comments that were hopefully to be found in the Q&A uh, at the bottom of the screen. So Brian, let's start with you. Joe, thanks a lot. Um, so much to think about. I mean, obviously I'm really interested in um, the, the sort of, uh, the, the cultural politics of the Eastern Bloc uh, and its uh, post-1948 split with Yugoslavia. But I'm gonna spare everybody and not get too much in the weeds with questions related to that. Um, there was another connection I wanted to bring up, which was, you know, I was really interested, you know, this is a novel focusing on, uh, if, I, if I'm understanding correctly, th three female protagonists uh, and if, with the narrative of a female prisoner at its heart. And there's, you know, there's a Czech novel that I'm really interested in called uh, Welcome to the Bleak House by Eva Kantokova, uh, a sort of a, a dissident author. And um, that novel seemed to really fit in the mold of what you described earlier in your talk. You know, this, this, uh, the narratives like uh, Solzhenitsyn's A Day in the Life of Ivan, Ivan Denisovich, where there's a lot more focus on the formation of different kinds of social collectives within the prison. And you describe that as being kind of a, a common sort of uh, feature of prison literature, carceral literature. And it sounds like obviously this is a very different kind of novel. Um, I'm wondering if you know we zoom out a little bit because you know so much about this longer tradition of prison and carceral literature, whether you can comment at all about to what extent gender matters in the way that these literary forms play out, right? Like that, um, you know, these narratives about female incarceration, do they tend to have similar or different patterns to sort of the literature maybe someone like me is more familiar with, you know, uh, whether that be gulag literature or, um, you know, the the sort of um, what we have, we are our own obviously native um, in the United States, prison literature that that I that I'm somewhat familiar with. So I'm I'm curious, kind of just if you could contextualize this novel within, and you mentioned it already a little bit, but say a little bit more about that. I hope that was clear. As always, you're clear. Um, yes, we can. I would suggest begin to work out linkages, uh, comparisons. Uh, on uh, issues of gender. Um, this novel takes up a separation of a um, mother and child. And uh, it turns out to have been a voluntary separation, which is devastating for the child. Um, and by a, a simple act of denunciation, she could have remained with the child. Um, and the, the link I would suggest is that uh, the separation from children uh, is a common feature of women's prison literature, uh, less so among men in uh, the US and US prison literature. So yes, there is that uh, common linkage. One of the things I've tried to do in this paper and which I, I uh, tried to do in the course syllabus uh, in teaching global carceral literature is to make the circle of connection between different traditions. And you could certainly do it in terms of gender. Um, and um, uh, it also becomes not simply a separation um, uh, mother and uh, child, but also women's uh, self social self assertion, um, when, and you might trace that back, for example, to uh, the English sufferist uh, uh, Constance Lytton. Uh, one has a um, sense of um, prison narratives as a means of self construction. Uh, by women. So I think there's a lot that can be pursued along these lines. Thanks, Joe. 
just as last time, I feel like we're going to construct a giant reading list out of these this lecture series for everybody. Natalie, go for it. Joe, um, thank you so, so much for your talk and the, the also very poetic way in which you delivered it. It was a real pleasure to listen to. And as I was listening, um, I was very much struck by something that you said in the beginning about the the genre of this text, right? You you called it faction. Um, so a combination of a fact and fiction. And the writer, one of the writers that I write about in my book is W.G. Zabald, who is famously known for combining um, factual, not, not only bits of history, but also uh, photography and um, actual objects that have real historical resonances, right? And interweaving them into his, what he calls prose uh, texts. So he calls them neither a fiction nor no fact. And his commitment to that has to do with, with an idea of history that's very much shaped by Walter Benjamin, right? Uh, a history that's not a linear and in which there are so many stories that go untold at every given moment, right? We, we never have all of history. We never have all of the experiences that everybody has gone through. And so uh, Zebald's combination of fact and fiction is meant to kind of nudge us to think about what is real, what else could have been real, right? It, it's this impetus to be a, an ethical reader, to be an activist reader, to engage with, with history and the histories that we may not be aware of, but that are there. And I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about why Grossman chooses to write this way. What are the the reasons behind that. I mean, you mentioned this this quotation by the the real um, woman whose uh, story he writes about, who who appreciated the fact that his book allowed her to imagine the story, how it never was, if I jotted that down correctly. Mm -hmm. So yeah, could, could you say a little bit more about this genre choice and everything that it implies? Well, throughout his career, Grossman has been known for um, interviewing people, for talking with people. Uh, the first book for which he gained international recognition, The Yellow Wind, was based on a series of interviews. Um, and so he, with his reputation, he can open a lot of doors uh, and he uh, talks with people. Uh, I know he did extensive research for this novel. Uh, I've been in touch with a uh, Croatian scholar um, who has a book coming out uh, this year uh, on Goli Otak from Stanford University Press. Um, and um, uh, uh, Grossman interviewed him extensively for the detail. Uh, he um, bases this novel on a foundation of fact. Um, and uh, there's this, uh, he seeks to pile on an aggregation of real and imagined experience. He is, um, uh, in so doing though, he uh, reveals what is invisible, what is not apparent in life on the kibbutz. He, uh, there is a distant prison that still controls their lives. Uh, so uh, in this sense, the novel is both fictional and factual. Um, and I think that that brings a credibility to the narrative that emerges. I, I do critique it, as you heard, towards its end for 
um, potentially uh, over romanticization. Uh, there's a little bit of the Count of Monte Cristo here um, embedded in this character who um, surmounts all. Uh, but um, the, the factuality of Goli Otak, uh, one of the reasons I have it right behind me on the screen, is undeniable. And it has been exposed through Goli Otak literature, uh, as have other prisons. Uh, I mentioned, for example, the Uyghur experience at present. Uh, and uh, there's an emergent uh, Uyghur prison literature. Um, so that emphasis, prison literature starts with a, re a reality and uh, proceeds from there. So I think Grossman's done a, a very credible job in this novel. Thank you. So I would like to uh, continue in that kind of on, on the factuality issue. First of all, I'm really interested in in Eva Panich Nahir. And, and can you tell us more from what you know or what Grossman has written? Um, why she chose this particular kibbutz to join? And how is she telling us something critical? Is the novel telling us something critical about Shara Makim itself, her adopted new home in Israel? So that would be the first question. The second question, since Grossman wrote as Manatzahov, Yellow, Yellow Time, I guess it's uh, uh, translated into English, when he actually interviewed Palestinians, why could not he has done the same thing, addressing the Palestinian, let's say, issue directly, as opposed to indirectly through the novel about another prison, another time, another war, and so forth. He he could have treated it upfront and kind of directly. And why didn't he do it? And may, maybe he's done it somewhere else, and I just don't know. Well, I haven't followed all of his writing, so I can't say that he has not dealt with Palestinian prisoners. I just don't know. Um, but my frank answer would be uh, that uh, Grossman is a very astute observer of um, Israeli society. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, he knows that a, um, a novel of uh, Palestinian prisoners and uh, the effects on a Palestinian family would probably not go very far. Um, and he does, however, have this friend who has uh, such an experience, and he works with that. Um, in a sense, it would be very difficult to write a novel about a Palestinian uh, family and its carceral uh, legacies uh, for an Israeli writer, a novelist. I think that would be open to question. Um, severe question. So he writes the material he has rather than um, um, something which is just not going to go very far given the current rift of society in Israel today. Now, but the novel, the, the relationship between Vera and Nina takes place in the kibbutz, right? It does. Uh, and uh, I, since I lived in the kibbutz for a year and a half, uh, I know something of the uh, very uh, convoluted um, stories of uh, romance and attraction that happen in a kibbutz setting. Um, and um, he's in some sense reflecting that, that sense of those convolutions in a very small, intimate society. Um, but as to why uh, Anish Nahir chose uh, Shara and Makin, I really don't know. Um, uh, we can't ask her anymore. She died in 2015. 
do you know when she came to Israel? What 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 year did she make Aliyah to Israel? In the mid 1950s. 50s. Um, and um, she was a socialist. Um, she looked for a socialist society. Um, she was uh, particularly a left socialist. Um, so something in uh, Kibbutz Shara Mekin appealed to her. I don't really know what. She married a um, uh, agriculturalist, an agricultural expert there. Um, so. Okay, I will look it up. <laughs> Interesting. We have three questions in the Q&A if you can take a look at them. Oh, yes. The first question, can you comment on the difference between the Hebrew title uh, and the English one? Oti ha'chayim mezehek harbi. And that I, I meant to mention, as in passing, I sort of mentioned that point. Uh, I didn't get into it. Um, but what I suggest is the Jessica Cohen, whose translations I know and very much enjoy. She's a wonderful translator. Um, he caught in that phrase uh, an immigrant's language. Um, it's not grammatically fluent in Hebrew. Um, it is, uh, so the English translation, um, I would suggest, uh, tries to capture that, um, uh, that sense of uh, it's not fluent Hebrew more than, uh, more than I love my life. Um, I'd say it's a pretty good stab at uh, renaming. Second question. Did the novel portray religious holidays being celebrated in the prison or other activities to maintain Jewish identity? Answer is no. Um, I don't think that was of uh, great consequence to punish Lahir. Um, and she's a secularist. Um, so I don't think that uh, well, there's nothing of the sort in the novel itself. Um, Zafrir, uh, Shalom Zafrir, uh, uh, says uh, Shomer Atzayir Kibbutz. So that was a good choice. I had, I didn't realize that. Even though oh, yeah. That, yeah. Uh, <laughs> actually, I do know it, but there's more to that choice. And, and who are the people in, in Sharon Makim? So it's it's beyond just the Shomer Atzayir versus the, the Yichud Kibbutzim. It's, it's, it's more than that. So maybe that has something to do with the men in, in that she, that she marries. That's a possibility. Um it's something to study, I, I guess. I, I will explore that myself, see what I can find. Um well, I'm the father of two schmutzniking. Oh. <laughs> uh, I'm I'm pleased that there's a connection uh, that is being pointed out here. I, I didn't know. So we uh, let's see. We don't have anything on the chat. So that's uh, we we can. Uh, con I I'm really intrigued. May I ask you another question? I'm really intrigued by your experience teaching literature, and you know helping people in prison to write literature. Can you tell us a little bit more about the prison as the context for the generation or for the, the production? Of uh, of any kind of literature, uh, since since you had at least ten years experience in 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 that and beyond beyond just knowing about the genre itself, I'm just I just find it so interesting. Uh, what exactly happens when people create either poetry or prose or 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 whatever fantasy novels or whatever in prison? If you can enlighten us on the condition of the prison writer. Well, 
we have over 2 million people incarcerated in the United States. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them write. They can write at some length. They write poetry. They write all different genres. Um, and this is a huge body of literature which remains um, basically unaddressed, uncritiqued. Um, I can count literally on one hand the number of critics who deal seriously with prison literature. Um, there is, for example, uh, one friend has instructed uh, the Prison Literature Archive, and um, it's being funded by NEH. Uh, he's moved it from Hamilton College, where he teaches, to uh, Johns Hopkins. Uh, their library has uh, taken over, and together with the NEH grant, they're building a basically huge database uh, of submissions from incarcerated writers. Um, they currently have about 3,000 annotated. So there is a immense body that lies unexamined. There would be those who dismiss it as um, uh, subliterary writing, so forth. They've not read any of it. And I'm the kind of critic who believes in reading before you talk about something. Um, so I read a good deal of prison literature. I think that we learn an awful lot. It's as varied as any other literature uh, in quality. Uh, and what is it to write in prison? Well, you've got a lot of time in prisons uh, and some people try to make use of it decently. Um, and uh, I've coached a lot of writing there. Um, I don't do it now since COVID shut down the prisons. I, I haven't returned uh, to teaching. I spent 10 years prior to that. Um, but um, they've got a lot to say and I think we gain from listening. Now, in a place like Goli Otok, they didn't have the capacity to write, right? Nobody would have given them a pen and a paper in a place like Goli Otok or Gulag, let's say. So not every not every prison will even make it possible for the incarcerated to write. Is that correct? Correct. Um, often prison literature is written upon release and um, people may take notes with them. Um, one of the things you find in prison is that um, there's limits on the amount of paper you can have. Uh, not simply if it's issued, but because it's regarded as a security risk if you have a lot of paper. Uh, people get killed by uh, cell fires uh, started mm -hmm. with paper. So prison authorities in the United States tend to be very careful about the amount of paper in any uh, setting. Uh, that's one limitation. Uh, people do not have access to word processing almost entirely. Uh, that's changing a little bit. Um, the introduction of tablets into uh, uh, prison settings. Um, but it is a um, uh, very difficult writing environment. And uh, I'm very respectful of those who manage to write entire novels. And they have an interest in writing pornography too. Um, the, uh, some of the work is uh, quite lovely, the poetry is. Uh, compelling, and I urge our uh, audience to pick up um, some um, prison literature. Um, 
just today, this morning, the uh, Haymarket uh, Publishers, together with a major foundation, the Mellon Foundation, um, uh, announced uh, 20 uh, well-paid writing fellowships for incarcerated or formerly incarcerated writers. Um, uh, one of those uh, was Arthur um, Long, uh, Longman, who um, uh, published a, a novel based explicitly on Sol Solzhenitsyn, One Day in the Life. Um, but he was writing from a Washington state prison. Um, and so there are uh, cross cultural influences to be found in prison literature that should be recognized. Um, so, um, and we have a long tradition of prison writing and prison teaching in uh, prisons, uh, writing uh, uh, classes in prisons in Arizona, uh, together with a couple journals that produce, uh, that publish uh, prison writing. Something to be attentive. You have another, you have another question and another reference from Tzafriel. So the question from Arlene Minuskin, if you can take it. Uh, what was the first spark that, uh, what was the spark that first led you to delve into prison literature? Uh, uh, there's some personal background there, but it was, uh, I don't want to get into, but it was a recognition that I, I believe in community teaching. I believe in that people such as myself who have uh, tenured faculty positions um, have a privilege and with that privilege comes a responsibility uh, to go out into the community and work there as well. Uh, after I got tenure uh, and I wasn't obligated to publish another word, uh, although I do all the time, uh, I decided to teach uh, in prisons. I'd been interested in it for some time. And uh, I was quite innocent about how to go about it. I simply wrote to about four or five different prisons and asked, can you use my help? And one of them answered, that was at Florence State Prison. And uh, I went down, I met with them, and we worked out an arrangement. And that uh, developed into a a uh, large program uh, where 40, 50 people from ASU were going down to uh, teach on a weekly basis. Um, I really prefer teaching and not being an administrator. Uh, so uh, after several years of, of uh, working to develop that program, I stepped out and became just a teacher again. Uh, but uh, I haven't gone back. Uh, these days, I do my community teaching as a as a Hebrew teacher. <laughs> Brian, you have a question. Oh, you have. Uh, we, let's see if we have another question there. If not, if you please. Oops. Oh, uh, that was that's a um, uh, reference uh, uh, to uh, some ASU people produce a uh, journal called Iron City. Um, with um, uh, writing from Arizona state prisons and from New Mexico. Okay, any other question from our panelists, from Natalie or for Brian? No? Well, if not, uh, Joe, you have... A one uh, last thing that you want my audience to remember besides you know inviting all of us actually to read the prison literature i would never even imagine the the uh, the scope of this kind of uh, material but I, I i will look into it and if i may uh, point out that if you look down the list of nobel prize winners you would be amazed at how many are prison writers indeed um I'm sure everybody knows the uh, the best published prison writer in the United States, but you don't know that he's a prison writer. 
John McCain, Faith of My Fathers, his autobiography, half of which is devoted to his prison experience. So it's often where we don't look for it and we don't think about people as prison writers, but um, the number of Nobel Prize winners who have written about or from prisons is astonishing. Mm. Well, amazing. Well, next week, the same time, Tuesday, seven o'clock, Natalie is going to share with us uh, maybe a different kind of literature, right? More immigrant type literature as opposed to imprisoned type literature. You want to say something for the audience come by way of uh, invitation for next week? Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to be talking a little bit about the the current uh, boom in German Jewish literature and that that kind of came out of the post-Soviet migration from Russia, from Ukraine, but also from places like uh, Azerbaijan. So there are a lot of new writers now in their 30s, 40s, who are thinking about what it means to be Jewish with that background, living in Germany, writing in German, and who are working through that in, in a variety of ways. And um, yeah, I'm really excited to talk a little bit about the historical context, which is very unique. And I think most people aren't familiar with how they came to Germany, um, what their experience was like, but then also how they deal with it differently in their writing. Some of the, uh, the books are very funny, um, uh, some of them are quite serious and fragmented. So I hope to just inspire people to, to delve in and do some reading. Great. We're looking forward to it. So thank you all for joining us. And thank you, Professor Lockhart, for introducing us to this novel and to this particular genre. It's really absolutely fascinating.